Boy, oh boy, oh boy. <laughs> We're getting face to face here. Wow. Is that you? It doesn't look like you. Have you changed? Did you do something with your face? You know, like rearranged it and shot it full of Botox or kind of stretched it and stuck it and tucked it and kind of rearranged it and, you know, kind of bobbed it and lifted it and stripped it and kind of like shaved it and made it and make up it and kind of like gave it a once over? Hmm. No? Oh, sorry. <laughs> You look weird. <laughs> My. Funny how that works. We can always seek to make ourselves look better than what we really are. And don't we always try to do that? I mean, don't we always try to put ourselves in a better light? What light? <laughs> oh, there it is. Sunlight. Or we try to change our image, you know, as though we were better than we are. <laughs> I could do the job, really. I really can. I think. Don't we sometimes, you know, lie, really? I mean, isn't most of what life that we're doing now is a lie? You know, we get all decked up and dressed up and act up and, you know, put on this working environment type of personality we have out there, you know, that we act one way at work when we act a different way at home. You know, we're very professional at work, but at home we let our hair down and walk around in sweats. Kind of, you know, kick back and smoke a doobie and, you know, take a six-pack, you know, and watch TV. I don't think that's what God intended. You know, one of the things you find out about being real in life is that you don't have to make a facade about who you are. You don't have to pretend to be something more than you are. You can just be you, and people will accept you as you are. And if they don't, you can move on to something else, and God will accept you as you are. Because God never told us to make ourselves out to be something that we're not. You see, before there was the Industrial Revolution, people were who they were. Jesus was the carpenter's son, and sure enough, whether he was a good carpenter or a bad carpenter didn't matter. He was the carpenter's son. That's who he was. That was his identity. And families just basically passed on these abilities, you know, to their children. You know, he kind of followed in their footsteps. Then suddenly, you know, when we got the Industrial Revolution and we thought that we were really smart and intelligent, we kind of screwed up all of society and made up our own rules and regulations where now individual people decide what they want to be when they grow up. Really? Wow. How's that working out for you? <laughs> Didn't work so good, did it? We're now in society where it looks like you can't have what you wanted to be. Because guess what? you got to be something else that you're not. So you got multiple resumes and multiple job settings and multiple this and multiple that that you become schizophrenic. Then people lose their minds because they lost their job, so they lose their life because they take people's life and themselves with it. Something's wrong here. I think you're taking life too seriously. Yeah. You know, God never intended us to live this way. He didn't want us to take our self-esteem and make some kind of esteem of ourselves by portraying ourselves to be something we're not. Because as we kept doing that, psychologists and psychiatry started teaching us that there's such a big difference between the id and the superego and the identity and the person you are and the person you want to be and the person you should be and the person you want to become. They couldn't even figure it out. So they started saying that people were mentally ill. As a matter of fact, I think they say that about everybody nowadays. Everybody's mentally ill. Of course, keeps them employed. <laughs> you know, the number one reason why people could become psychiatrists? To find out the solution to their problem. Then you ask them, did they find a solution? No. Kind of weird, huh? Looking for a solution and then making a profession of it. Hmm. That's interesting. Do you know that the Bible has the answer to everything? Including psychiatry and psychology? Including your ego and your superego and your id and your soma and your pneuma? <laughs> God has an answer for everything that goes on in life. And it's in the Word. He created us, so He has a plan for us. He determined a long time ago how He wanted us to live, and He wrote it down in a book. Now, if He wrote it down in a book before the foundations of the world ever were laid, 
do you think maybe we ought to check in with him and find out what he's got planned for us? Or do we just kind of keep working it out ourselves that, well, you know, I spent 20 years learning to be an electrician. I'm going to stay an electrician. What if you suddenly got up one day and became a missionary? Me? Uh, how would I live? Um, I think God said birds of the air, you know, the grass of the valley, you know, the, the trees, you know, you need to read nor sow, you know, all that stuff that God said he provide, you know, well, you've been busy working it instead of living it, you know, working it out the hard way instead of doing it the easy way. But but God wouldn't provide for that. No, 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 I can't follow God like that. That means I'd have to trust him to provide. What about the economy? <laughs> How's that working out for you? Trusting your unemployment to last? Oh boy, are you in for a good one. <laughs> yep, just keep trusting. Because guess what? When it's gone. <laughs> just out of curiosity, how is that working out for you? You know, the 20-year plan, the 15-year plan. You know, all these plans that man has, you know, to retire from their company, you know. Take their 401k and roll it into this and roll it into that. And then suddenly they find out that, you know, guess what? It's gone because somebody invested it somewhere else. Huh. How is that working out for you? <laughs> How is life working out for you? Today, ask God to remove every false trust. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17.9 Many of us become extremely skillful in arranging our lives so as to admit the truth of Christianity without being embarrassed by its implications. We have the kind of Christian life we want to stamp our life with. After all, we have the stamp that says Christian, bing! So whatever I do, as long as I do it in the name of Jesus, I can do it. You know, I can be a football star, I can be a jock star, I can be a movie star, I can be a porno star. Wait a minute, can I be a porno star? That doesn't sound right. Well, if it doesn't sound right to be a porno star, why is it right to be a football star? Why is it right to be a basketball star? Hmm. I wonder if maybe somewhere along the way, maybe people have just stamped everything with Christian and said it's okay to do it your way. Hmm. We arrange things so that we can get on well enough without divine aid, while at the same time we're always ostensibly seeking it. God, I invested all this money in my company and now it's going under. You've got to bail me out. You don't want me to go bankrupt, do you? You reap what you sow. If you sow to the wind, you reap the whirlwind. Um, well, I don't know, you know. Let me see. Let me check your portfolio first. You know, well, let's see. You, you, your name is written in the book of life, you know. And Yeah, you are going to inherit eternity, but you went out and you got yourself really in debt. Hmm, sounds like perfect rapture material. Oh, wait a minute. You won't be... If you're thrown in jail, you won't be out in time for the rapture. <gasps> If you're in debt, you know, you may not make it. Ooh, we might have to worry about this. How, how are you doing on mercy and grace? Have you been giving mercy and grace to other people? See, I want to forgive your debt. But if you haven't forgiven other people their debts, then I'm sorry, I can't forgive your debt. And you're just going to have to, like, maybe take your chances in the tribulation. Because after all, hey, you know, you reap what you sow. And, you know, if you were merciful, I'd be merciful to you. If you were loving, I'd be loving to you. If you were kind, I'd be kind to you. But your grace, you know, unfortunately, you, you just haven't been so graceful lately. You know, you really haven't been extending grace to other people. So, tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you a deal. I'm not going to charge you interest. I'm just going to charge you to go through it. Man, you overcome it. You got it. You do it. It's all yours. Bingo. Debt wiped out. You don't like that one, huh? think you better read what Jesus had to say. Those parables, <laughs> ooh, they nasty things, man. They kind of confuse the rapture a little bit. Or do they? Maybe they explain the rapture and why some people maybe aren't going. <laughs> oh, maybe we should have listened to what Jesus had to say in the first place. Instead of stamping a rubber stamp of Christianity on everything we're doing. Oh, maybe, maybe... That Sermon on the Mount, maybe all that kind of stuff that Jesus was talking about, he was talking about for real. Ooh, imagine that, Jesus talking for real. 
To many, Jesus is little more than an idea or at best a ideal. He is not a fact. No, he's just some kind of theoretical concept. You know, a nice philosophy. A way to arrange your life but not actually live it. He's not literal, is he? They talk as if he were real and act as if he were not. Yeah, we're living in the last generation. That's why we went out and took out 20-year loan. You know, yeah, we're living in the last generation. That's how come we're taking out, you know, we're buying more cars and, you know, we're investing in our children's future, you know, and we're, uh, by the way, you know, of course, you know, we're occupying until he comes, but, you know, he's not coming right away, right, Lord? You know, and we're, we're going to go ahead and, you know, and like pay for that, you know, college tuition, you know, that's going to be 40 years in the making or 20 years from now, you know, right, Lord? You're not coming 20 years, right? 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 Right. Acting as though Jesus never returns by your actions speaking louder than your words. What kind of last generation person are you? Or are you lying in the first place? You see, I know how I've lived, but how are you living? And this is the one time that I can't examine myself because if I examine myself, you're busted. Because <laughs> frankly, I'm keeping a very light touch on this world, you know, because I don't want to have anything hold me back. Man, we ain't no lot here. We ain't no Abraham's wife or Lot's wife looking back. Man, I ain't going to need to be rescued, you know, out of that city because I'm not in the city. I'm out of here just as fast as I can let my feet get to walk in and take me talking right out of this kingdom back into the place where God has created light and fellowship and love and fellowship and joy and peace and prosperity for me, not in this world, but in that world. <laughs> and I'm out of here, dude. So, no offense. Hey, you know, if you're not getting ready, go ahead. Have your Harleys. Have your income. Have your mortgages, have your loans, have your credit card debt. Yeah, I think that, you know, you're going to have to put on the little cap, you know, and I think we're going to have to take a look at your financial statement. Oh, no. And you want to go where? And you want to do what? And you want to do it when? Eh, sorry. No can do. Looks like the books say you have to stay here until you pay the last farthing. Uh uh no, no, no. I told you, you got to pay your debts. Or if you don't pay your debts, you got to go with grace. And if you weren't graceful, you weren't loving, you weren't merciful, uh, then I'm not going to be so merciful. I'm going to have to put the books open. And we're going to open the books and say, okay, here you are. You see what you did to Joe? Well, you paid Joe back. Guess what? We'll talk about it. See what you did to Harry? Well, you know what? We're going to make the books even. As soon as you take care of Harry. Matter of fact, Joe and Harry are going to be in tribulation. So you know what? You can take care of them too. Maybe you should witness to him. <laughs> Ooh, sounds nasty, doesn't it? Funny how God operates like that. We call it the book of Revelation, the letters to seven churches. To many, Jesus is little more than an idea. Yeah, right. We can prove our faith by our committal to it and in no other way. If our faith is real, then we'll live it. Because if we're not living it and we're talking about it, then it's phony. Because I can look around and see all the people that are telling me, oh yeah, Jesus is coming. And they tell their grandchildren, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm the first one to tell you, your grandchildren aren't going to grow up. Matter of fact, you're going to probably see them die. Or be raptured. One of the two. Ain't going to be two ways about it. Sorry. This world is ending. We call it the end of the world for a reason. Not because it terminates permanently, but because it's going to be catastrophically made over. Yeah. Like dramatically <laughs> it's not going to be like you know oh well we're going to have a little bit of earthquake here and a little bit of flood here and a little bit of fire there you know and then we're going to build it all back up and have our computers and our iPads and i this and i that you know the whole idea behind the iPad and the iPhone and all the i i i's should have warned us that it's not about i but it's about him and that it's about to end because it's going to be him that's coming in the end hello Man, I mean, even society is beginning to tell us it's the end of the world. Whew. Any belief that does not command the one who holds it is not a real belief. If you're not living it, then it's not true. So if you're not proving it by your life and your actions, then don't tell me you believe in the end of the world. Don't tell me you believe in Jesus and unless you're doing the things he said. Don't call yourself a Christian unless you're becoming Christ-like. But we have another way. We could probably get away with grace and mercy if we just, you know, kind of like started to apply it to every other single person in the world, like loving them. 
I think if you loved him, you might get away with something. And it might shock some of us profoundly if we were brought suddenly face to face with our beliefs and forced to test them in the fires of practical living. How well does your word live up to your life? How well are you living it? And how's it working out for you? Because frankly, dude, I want to know. I want to know. You really got this thing down to science? I want to hear it. You know, I want to check out your insurance policy because I want to know whether you're rapture ready or whether you're just playing like you're going to go somewhere that you're going to take it all with you because you're enjoying your kingdom now and you're having your cake and ice cream and you're going to party hardy until you get there. I don't think so. I think maybe we need to look again at the scriptures because frankly, I think the house is beginning to catch fire and I'm smelling smoke. Ooh, smells bad to me. We need very badly in these days is a company of Christians who are prepared to trust God completely now as they must do at the last day. For each of us, the time is surely coming when we shall have nothing but God. No car, no home, no wife, no life, no this, no that, no up, nor down, nor left, nor right, no politics. No blame game, no shame, no whatever you want to call it that you've been doing all your life as a Christian. Hello. Guess what? It's coming real soon. We need to be about those that have nothing but God and never have had anything else but God to try and rely on. Because you see, the poor and needy have always had God. The destitute, the ones lying in the street in the gutter, the ones that have no home, the ones that desperately need and cry out, God hears. And He may allow them to die in order to be with Him because He has mercy upon them and chooses to save them to the uttermost. But what are we doing in the reality of our lives that have been blessed with all the finances that we want? Are we passing the test or have we failed miserably? Today is the best time to invite God to remove every false trust, to disengage our hearts from all the secret hiding places of things we are attached to and we have become attached from, and to bring us out into the open where we can discover for ourselves whether we actually trust Him. This is a harsh cure, but it is a sure one. I know through the gates of splendor that a man decided to give up his vocation to become a missionary to, I think it's Ecuador and because of his actions the people eventually got saved though he died as a martyr I hear a lot of stories about how wonderful these ministries are of these great football stars and great people that you know have gotten into some kind of fame game you know and how much they're able to use this money you know in order to be in these ministries and then get all these accolades did you know that they've already received a reward that anyone who has received great you know accolades or great notoriety from society that they've already received their reward. Jesus said it. He's very blunt about it. He, as a matter of fact, he said the only thing you're going to get when you get into heaven is a penny for your wages. The man who's hired in the morning gets a penny. The man who's hired at noon gets a penny. And the man who's hired at night gets a penny. It's all equal in God's eyes. The capacity with which you have to enjoy it will be different because you'll have a greater you know, volume, so to speak, of fulfillment but the point is is that God wants us to be about his work his choices his decision-making process we need to lay down our lives again and become the Jesus people we were supposed to be because if you're not living all of it for God you're not living any of it for God the reality of what you are isn't by what you say but what you're doing and how you're acting and for me, frankly, if I was on one of those Christian cruises, I'd be worried about the Titanic. Man, I'd be thinking, you know what? I'd be looking over that edge and thinking, maybe God's going to sink this boat because I think we're partying in the wrong way. I think this vacation idea is kind of like the wrong message that we're sending to the world. I think this whole concept of just like, let's do something for ourselves 
is the wrong message to be sending about Jesus who denied himself. Christianity, in some ways, is going to be rejected by God. And if you read the letters to the seven churches, when Jesus said bluntly, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? He was speaking of this time now that we live in because we are worldly and ungodly to the utmost extension of grace that we could possibly imagine and still trying to get away with it. Because what Jesus said in the letters to seven churches was one out of seven. And if you look around and you started counting all the Christians there are in the world and you took one out of seven, that's not very many. And that's a tragedy. So for you, you're a Christian, right? You talk to God, right? You know God, right? You walk with God, right? You live like you walk the talk, right? You're doing what He's told you to do, right? Or are you? That's the question. And that's the heart of the issue, isn't it? Are you doing what God has been telling you to do all along? And when it comes time, will you be left behind because of what you didn't do?